Praise the Lord, Church. Oh my God, I didn't hear anything. Praise the Lord, Church. How many of you are glad to be in God's house this morning? Amen. So, uh, if you all have your Bibles with you, can we uh, just rise up to our feet and can we turn to Psalms chapter eighty-nine? Psalms chapter eighty-nine. And if you're all there, we could read it together. Yeah, from uh, verses 1 to 16. It goes like this. I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth, I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever. That you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne stand firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness too, in the assembly of the holy ones. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than those who surround him. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging seas. When its waves mount up, you still them. You crushed Rahab like one of the slain. With your strong arm, you scattered your enemies. The heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. You created the north and the south. Tabor and Hermon sing for joy at your name. Your arm is endured with power. Your hand is strong. Your right hand exalted. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. They rejoice in your name all day long. They exult in your righteousness. Amen. For who is like the Lord in all the years? Amen. Father, this morning we just come before you, O Lord God. Father God, we come seeking your face, O Lord God. Seeking, O Lord God, your presence. Lord God, this morning we believe in what your word says, O Lord God. When you say that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Father God, whatever we've been throughout, been throughout the week, O Lord God, every form of weakness, every form of troubles, every form of sorrows. Father, today we want to lay it down at your feet. For we believe that your yoke is easy and your burdens are light. Lord God, I pray that even as we worship you, even as, as we sing a few songs, Father, I pray may you come and may you be enthroned on the praises of your people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Father, this morning, I pray, O oh Lord God, would you give us the authority in the spiritual realm, O oh Father God. Lord God, that every word that is uttered through your spirit, O oh Lord God, that it would take, O oh Lord God, to take its stand, O oh Lord God. And Father, I pray, Lord God, let your name alone be glorified. Let your name alone be exalted. Father, for this morning we've come, O oh Lord God, to acknowledge that you alone are God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, 
I will soar with you above the storms. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. Because when the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, this morning we enthrone you as King of Kings, as Lord of Lords. Father, even as we sing a few songs, even as we hear your word, Father, I pray may you come and be exalted amidst your people. And all God's people say, Amen, Amen. Can we turn to our neighbor? Come on quickly, turn to your neighbor. Say, who is like the Lord? Come on, if they're, feel, if they're sleepy, shake them up and say, who is like the Lord? Come on, shake them up and say, who is like the Lord? There is no one, amen? So even as we sing this song, let us put our hands together and worship His name.
Father, we just want to exalt your name. For your name is high and lifted up. You are exalted in the heavens. Father, you are exalted on the earth. Let your name forever be glorified. Father, this morning we just want to thank you for the privilege that you've given us. As a people to be called by your name. Who are redeemed by your blood. Just want to thank you. My dear brothers and sisters, you know, one day when we get to heaven, there, there are going to be no stages. There's not going to be any stage, no worship leader, nothing. But it's just going to be a people of God who are redeemed by the, by the precious blood of Jesus. No, although they don't deserve it, they don't deserve it. But still, because of God's unconditional love, they are there. It's just going to be a people of God worshipping before God. Day and night. Night and day. Saying, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Amen? How many of you are re really excited, are waiting for that day? You know, when we get to stand before our God and just worship His name. You know, in the book of Isaiah chapter 59, it says that the eyes of God, it was looking throughout the it was looking at the earth. You know, and there was a lot of wickedness. Lot of unrighteousness. Lot of injustice. You know, the heart of God was searching for someone, you know, who would uphold God's justice. Who would uphold His, righteous, no, his righteousness. You know, living in this wicked world, that one person, that people of God, you know, who would be ready. Who would say, no, this is wrong. This is not what the Word of God says. But unfortunately, there was no one. So God had to take things in His own hand. The Word of God says, by His own arm, He has given us salvation. Amen? The arm of God is the only thing that sustains Him. And because it sustains Him, it will sustain us. He will sustain us. Amen? So today, as we're going to do a Tamil song, you know, it speaks about how God made a way for the Israelites parting the Red Sea. Of how God gave them, provided them food to ravens. Where God opened the heavens, where manna fell. You know, our God, we don't serve a helpless God. But we serve a God who, with, who is mighty who's strong in battle, whose arm is not too short that it can't save. Amen. So the chorus of this uh, song goes like this. Come on, can we try that?
want to exalt your name. Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you are like no other gods. You do not need help of anyone. Father, so this morning we choose to fix our eyes on you. We choose to shift our focus away from the waves, away from the storms. And we look, choose to look to face you, O Lord God, to shift our eyes towards you. For as it is written, I lift my eyes until the hills. Where does my help come from? Father, we know that our help can only come from you, the maker of heaven and earth. Father, all we need is one touch from you. Father, all we need, oh Lord God, is that one word from you. And everything will change. Our lives will change. Our lives will be transformed. Oru vaarthi sonnal ellame maari pogu en nirkamellam duramodi pogu oru vaarthi sonnal ellame maari pogu en nirkamellam duramodi pogu father just one word ஒரு வார்த்தை சொன்னால் எல்லாமே மாறி போகும் என் நேர்க்கமெல்லாம் தூரம் ஓடி போகும் உமக்கு உதவி தேவையில்லை நீரே பெரியவர் உம் கரத்தின் வல்லமை எல்லாம் செய்து முடிக்கும் உமக்கு உதவி தேவையில்லை நீரே பெரியவர் உம் கரத்தின் வல்லமை எல்லாம் செய்து முடிக்கும் Come on, can we just lift up our hearts? Can we just lift up our voice and begin to exalt this God, this King of Kings? Come on. Can we lift up our voice? Say, God, you are great. God, there is no one like you. Father, you alone are the creator of heavens and earths. Father God, by your mighty hands and outstretched arm, Father God, you have made a way. 
There is no other God besides you. And we just want to acknowledge and we just want to crown you King of Kings. You are the only living God. There is none beside you. Because oh, our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God. Our God. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. Awesome in power, our God. Our God. Come on, can we declare our God? Our God is greater. Our God is strong.
together with one voice. of us John it says for this reason the son of man came that he might destroy the work of the devil how many of you are glad that the work of the devil has been destroyed by the cross amen so can we just lift up our voice and say God thank you thank you Jesus for destroying the work of the devil over my life thank you for destroying the bondage oh Lord God thank you for destroying the chains Thank you for destroying strongholds over my life. Father, because you are exalted. Father God, just as you said in John chapter 3, verses 14. Just as Moses lifted up that snake stuff. And all who looked to it was, were lived. In the same way, all those who looked to the Son of Man. Those who call upon His name, they will be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whoever believes in Him will not perish but will have everlasting life. Those who believe in Him will not be condemned. But those who don't believe, who don't acknowledge that He is the only way. He is the only truth and He is the only life. They stand condemned. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the morning came. Lord God, you swallowed up death in victory. We just want to thank you. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. 
your buried body began to breathe out of the silence the and give worship to Jesus. Death has lost its grip on me. Get in Jesus' name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. This morning, if there is anyone among us who saying, Brother, I cannot sustain. I feel weary in my spiritual walk with Christ. I've been praying for something for so long and I'm beginning to lose hope. I'm allowing room for doubt in my heart whether God can really do this for me. But my dear brothers and sisters, the same God who parted the seas when all the Israelites saw were open oceans, God made, God saw and God made a way. When God could deliver the disciples, when He could use the disciples so mightily, when He could use the early church so mightily, where the blind began to see, the ears of the deaf were unlocked, the layman began to leap for joy, giving praise to God. There's nothing too hard for our God. This morning, if you would just put your hope, if you would ju just put your faith in Jesus, believing that He would do it, that He would come through for you, there is nothing, nothing on earth can stop what God has planned for you. The Word of God says that you are more than overcomers because Christ overcame, because He endured hardship. God exalted him as the highest above everything. The name that is high above every other name. This morning, if you are looking for a breakthrough, even as we sing this verse one last time, believe in faith that God has conquered everything. That everything, it is finished. There is nothing left. But hope, just as those five virgins were ready, waiting for the bridegroom so we are ready we have not lost hope out of the silence the roaring lion declared the, the grave has no claim on you out of the silence the If you believe it, 
digs at the grave has no claim on me. Dick let these chains has no claim on me. Dick let this fear has no claim on me. Dick let this temptation has no claim on me. Dick let these weapons has no claim on me Cause Jesus yours is a victory Father may your name alone be exalted May all glory, all honor, all power, all blessing, all wisdom belong to you. For worthy is the Lamb that was slain. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for our transgressions. Father, this morning, O oh Lord God, we want to bring to you our dear brothers and sisters, O oh Lord God, who have been going through a tough time, O oh Lord God, who have been afflicted with bodily sickness, with mental sickness. My dear brothers and sisters, can we just lift up our voice before God? Lift up our dear brothers and sisters before God, even as the names come up on the screen. If someone has asked you to pray for them, can we just lift them up before God? Because God is here in the midst of His people. Can we just lift up our voice? Lord God, we want to pray for Pastor Thomas Daniel, Lord God, who had undergone a, a eye surgery after a hemorrhage. Father, and we want to lift up to you his wife, oh Lord God, Sister Eliama, who has been diagnosed with stage 2 cancer. Father, we want to lift up to you Mary, who has been who has been diagnosed with cancer. Father, we want to lift up to you our dear brother Lockley Raymond, who is having fourth stage cancer. Father, we want to bring to you our dear sister Annie Michael, who is having second stage breast cancer. Father Jerusha, who is having cancer. Father, what is cancer, Lord God, that it must defy you. It must come against your people. Father, this morning, oh Lord God, if you would just say the word, Father, we know that it is, in, it is not impossible for you, that everything is possible for him who believes. Father God, and we believe by, by your stripes we are healed. Father God, just say the word, oh Lord God. You send forth your word and you heal our disease. Father, we, we ask of you, God, would you have mercy? Father, we want to bring to you our dear brother Soji, who's not feeling well. Father God, Yeshuda, who is having multiple health complications. Father God, and we want to lift to you our dear sister Anita, who's having an open heart surgery. Father God, as we read in, the, in your word of how you moved in the early days, Father God, we believe, we as your body, we still believe that you are alive and you're moving, that your word is still alive and active. Father, we know that you are moving, O oh Lord God. So, Son of David, would you have mercy on our dear brothers and sisters? Father, we want to lift to you our dear brother Stephen Golden. Please, Lord God, would you give him salvation? Would you set him free from his drug addictions? Father, would you have mercy? Son of David, would you have mercy? Father, I pray let you, by this healing, O oh Lord God, let your name alone be glorified. Let testimonies arise. Let hope arise. Let faith arise. Knowing that, that there is deliverance in Jesus' name. That there is healing in your name.
Father, we know that you are still moving. Father God, we thank you, Lord God, that when we as your church, when we prayed, we as your body, when we prayed, oh Lord God, for Samara, who had dengue, oh Lord God, and who was unwell. Father God, we thank you for your answer that she's healed in Jesus' name. We thank you, we praise you for this, O oh Lord God. Lord God, we know that there are many testimonies, O oh Lord God, many things that have not come up yet, O oh Lord God. But we thank you, I pray, Spirit of God, would you give us the boldness? Would you give us that spirit, O oh Lord God, to declare the praises of our God, to declare the works of our God, to declare, to pray, to intercede for our dear brothers and sisters. Father God, just as your spirit was hovering over the waters in the beginning, Lord God, and just as your eyes are looking on the faithful in the land, Father, I pray, O oh Lord God, when your eyes look at us, may we be found faithful. May we be found as people who are ready to uphold justice. Lord God, to uphold your justice, your righteousness. Father, I pray that your spirit would come and rest upon our generation. Father God, that in the days to come, oh Lord God, we would see you moving mightily. Father God, that you would set apart this generation as a generation holy unto the Lord, as a people holy unto the Lord. Father, and we just want to magnify your name, oh Lord God. Even as we hear your word, Lord God, I pray, oh Lord God, would you prepare our hearts as good soil to receive your word. Father God, and I pray, oh Lord God, the enemy would not try and snatch it away. Father God, I pray that these seeds that are sown today, it would take root in our hearts. It would take root in our lives. And may it bring, bring you glory, Almighty God. To you belongs all the glory all the honor and all the praise. In Jesus' most matchless name and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Our prayer guide for October is out and this month's theme is rooted in prayer. We believe that prayer keeps us grounded and connected to God's heart. If you'd like a copy and want to experience the power of prayer, just raise your hand and our ushers will bring one to you. You can also download it online at pit.ly slash NLAGCPG. On the first of every month, we come together as a family of Christ to begin the new month in prayer to seek God's guidance, favor, and blessings. So join us on the 1st of October at 6 a.m. via Zoom. Kindly note the Zoom details displayed on the screen or reach out to our help desk for more details. Dear parents and kids, Get ready for Shine 2024, our kids' talent event happening on October 26th. Children aged 3 to 16 are invited to showcase their talents from memory verse recitation, drawing, storytelling and character depiction to preaching, instrumental solos, singing and more. Register by October 20th through the link on the screen. We can't wait to see the amazing talents you'll bring. Dear youth, 
Feeling like you've been waiting forever for a miracle or breakthrough? We get it. But remember, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from our Heavenly Father. That's why we're inviting you to join us for an evening of prayer on September 29th at 5 p.m. at Stuart Hall, Little Mount. And guess what? Our senior pastor D. Mohan will be there as our special guest. Don't miss it. Register now at bit.ly slash NLG community. Looking forward to seeing you there. For more details, latest updates and for online giving, log on to bit.ly slash NLG community. I request the ashes to please take up the offering. And God is good. Wow, it was so very mellow. God is good. Amen. It is easy, you know, to just declare. But only when we're going through situations that we truly understand that God is good all the time. Amen.
morning, church. A little louder. Good morning. So uh, today we have a, a guest preacher with us, and we have a privilege to have him. Uh, so I was just uh, thinking, how do I introduce him? But then when I was going through his introduction, I thought uh, it's better for me to read it, uh, right? So uh, because I cannot put that in my words. So uh, our uh, preacher for today, he is the founder and president uh, of Truth Matters International, a ministry that is focused on engaging those who are in the academics and uh, equipping those who are in the church to how to share the gospel in a creative way. Accordingly, this ministry seeks to challenge the dominant ideological voices of our time and uh, uh, by presenting God's eternal word. Uh, so he is very passionate about evangelism here, and uh, he has spoken in numerous churches, organization, convention, youth conference, mission-related event. He was privileged to lecture at the Academy of Science in Poland and Czech Republic, along with being a featured uh, speaker at UNESCO in Belgium. He's also presented a lecture at the Oxford University seven consecutive years through the inv invitation of Professor Alistair Megra. So he regularly addresses issues of theology, philosophy, science, technology, ethics related topics that uh, he presented uh, lectures and papers in the academics in various universities like Harvard, MIT, Yale, UC Berkeley, among others. So why don't we just put your hands together and welcome Brother Finney Joseph Prem Kumar. Before we get into his word, I'm just gonna sing a familiar hymn. If you know the words, please sing along with me. and the opportunity he's given me to share his word with you. And I want to thank Pastor Chadwick Mohan 
for his kind and gracious invitation. It's such an honor for me to join you at this worship service. I bring you greetings from my father, Reverend Dr. Prem Kumar Dharmaraj, and my family back home in Los Angeles, California. My father knew Brother Chadwick's dad, Pastor Mohan, for many, many years, starting in the 1970s, and he had the privilege and honor of preaching at the Tamil service right here in Saidapet over the years. And so it's wonderful to be here, and I look forward to all that God has in store for us. You see, a visiting preacher had just delivered a sermon at a local church, and he was standing in the back of the sanctuary. And one of the parishioners went up to him and said, you know, preacher, today your sermon reminded me of two things. It reminded me of God's peace, and it reminded me of God's love. The preacher was rather taken back because he had never heard those sentiments expressed about his sermon before. So he looked at the parishioner and asked them to explain themselves. The parishioner looked at the preacher and said, it reminded me of God's peace because everything that you said surpassed all my understanding. And then the parishioner said, it reminded me of God's love because your sermon really endured forever. <laughs> and so this morning, as I share with you what God has placed upon my own heart, I pray that it will enlighten your minds and that by God's grace, I'll be able to do it within the time that has been allotted to me. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Oh Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this place. We thank you for your presence and we thank you for your power. Lord, thank you for your divine word. Thank you for the truth found within. Now, as we study your word, as we meditate on the truth, May the truth not only be embedded in our hearts, help us to embody it in our lives. Help us to understand the kind of God you are and the kind of people that you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Looking at the chaotic and confusing times in which we live, Robert Fitch issued these very perceptive words. Ours is an age in which ethics has become obsolete. It is superseded by science, deleted by philosophy, and dismissed as emotive by psychology. It's drowned in compassion, evaporates before aesthetics, and retreats before relativism. The usual moral distinctions between right and wrong are drowned in a maudlin emotion in which we feel more sympathy for the murderer than for the murdered, for the betrayed than for the adulterer, and in which we have begun to believe that the real guilty party, the one who somehow cost it all, is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. Is the victim and not the perpetrator of the crime. If you don't believe me, watch your news each and every night. In a culture, in a world that is morally unhinged and spiritually dead, is it still possible to live a life that is righteous, a life that is holy, a life that is pleasing to God, a life that is centered on Him? That's the question before you this morning. That's the question before me this morning. We're going to meditate on the life of a man whose life was centered on God, a man who shows us that holy and righteous living is possible in any context, in any situation, in any point in human history, as long as your eyes are upon him. As long as your eyes are focused on him. As long as he is the center and the circumference of your existence, that kind of life becomes a possibility. You see, God implanted a dream in this man, the dream giver, implanted a dream, and then he worked on the dreamer. The dreamer in whom he implanted the dream went through various situations, went through various circumstances in his journey of life. But the divine dream giver worked his purposes, worked his plans in and through all of these things that converged in his life. It all begins in Genesis chapter 37. As 17-year-old Joseph, wearing the coat of many colors that his father has given to him, as the favorite son of his dad, sharing his dreams with his brothers. Both his dreams, basically that his father and his mother and his brothers would bow down to him in the near future. And so as you can imagine, the brothers were absolutely angered by what they had heard. And so when Jacob sends Joseph out to the mountains to look out on his brothers, they plot to kill him. That's what the word of God says. They plot to kill him. 
Reuben steps in and tells them that they should throw him into a pit. So they strip him of all his clothes and into the pit goes Joseph. And then Judah suggests that they sell him to a caravan of Ishmaelites. They sell him for 20 pieces of silver. They take his coat, they dip it in some goat's blood and bring it back to a heartbroken father who mourns for his precious son. This is the context of the story. The context of the dream giver who implanted his dream in this young man, 17 years old. And the situations and the circumstances of his life story begins. The first thing we see, the first thing that he endures, the first thing that Joseph encounters is this. We see the adversities in the pit. We see the adversities in the pit. The brothers said to each other, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's toss him into the pit and we'll see what becomes of his dreams. A Sunday school teacher was teaching her little boys and girls a lesson on the Ten Commandments. After teaching them the commandment, honor thy father and thy mother, she asked them, is there a commandment that teaches us how we should treat our brothers and our sisters? Little Jimmy said, thou shall not kill. <laughs> the brothers said, here comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. Let's toss him into the pit. And we'll see, we'll see what becomes of his dreams. My dear brothers and my dear sisters, when you experience life in the pit, the first thing you need to realize is this. You have to be careful who you share your God-given dreams with. Be careful who you share your God-given dreams with because every dream that God implants in your heart, every dream that God places in your life has its detractors, every single dream. Every dream has its detractors. People who lack the faith and vision and they'll tell you your dream is improbable. They'll tell you your dream is inconceivable. They'll tell you your dream is impossible and they'll try to kill it even before it begins. Every dream has its detractors. The brothers said, let's see. Let's see what happens. Let's toss him into the pit and we'll see what becomes of his dreams because they knew that if you could somehow kill the dream, you don't have to worry about the dreamer anymore. Sadly, that's the condition of many believers. Sadly, that's the condition of many Christians whose dreams have been tossed into the pit by others. If you ask them, they'll tell you. Five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I had my dreams, I had my desires, I had my visions. I was as bright as the morning sun. I was ready to conquer the world. But my dreams were tossed into the pit by others, by situations and circumstances that I could not control. And now I'm left to wallow in the pit. My dear brother, my dear sister, if you feel yourself experiencing the pit, if you are deep in the pit, take heart, God is not done with you yet. There is a caravan on the way to take you to your destiny. Every dream, every dream has its detractors. Secondly, every dream has its detours. Every God-given dream in your life, in my life, has its detours. John Maxwell once said, between the inception of the dream or the conception of the dream and the realization of the dream, there is a process and that process often involves detours. Joseph did not know that he was going to be tossed into the pit. Joseph did not know that he would end up in a prison. Joseph did not know that his brothers would try to kill him. One detour after another. It happens in your life, does it not? Just when you think you're about to realize your dream, everything falls apart. Just when you feel that you've reached the end, everything comes apart. Everything gets derailed. And you're left wondering, what happened to the dream? Did he really implant the dream in my heart and in my life? So many detours in my way. Every turn that I take is a detour. I did not know that this was going to happen. But every dream, my dear friends, has its detours. And then every dream has its delays. Every single dream has its delays. John Wesley, the father of Methodism, once said, delays never thwart God's intentions. It merely polishes you and I who are his instruments. Every time there is a delay, remember, 
the maker, your creator, the dream giver, is merely polishing you. He's getting you ready for the future that he has in store for you. No one can thwart his dreams for you. No one can thwart his intentions towards you. No one can thwart his plans for your life. No one. He's merely polishing you, my dear friend. He's merely readying you for your future. But we are time conscious folk, aren't we? We want the dreams established right away. When the light turns green, we're ready to go. But God says, sometimes there are delays. Because I'm shaping you, I'm molding you. I'm structuring you into the kind of person I want you to become. You know, when golf balls were first manufactured, they had smooth covers. And then they found out if the ball was roughed up, it went further. And so they made them, made them with dimple covers. That's how it is in life. Sometimes when we're roughed up by situations and circumstances, by people who scheme against us, Sometimes when these things happen, things beyond our control, we go farthest in accomplishing God's purpose and God's plan for our lives. And so today, if you feel like you're sitting in the midst of shattered hopes and dreams, if all that you see are the detractors and the detours and the delays all around you, and you're losing heart, look up from the pit that you're in, because that's the only place you can look when you're down deep in the pit of life. Look up as Joseph did and listen to a God who says, trust in me. Have your faith and your hope and your confidence in me. I am with you every step of the way. Every step of the way. There is no blueprint. There is no pathway clear of stones and rocks and nails. There is only absolute faith and confidence and hope and trust in God as he shows you that there is no mountain without a valley. There is no triumph without a trial. There is no life without a story. And in the darkness of the pit, as he takes your life and my life, and as he repositions it from the standpoint of eternity, you might even want to thank him for your tears because they clear your eyes and my eyes for a better vision of who God is, of who God is. He clears our eyes so that we can see what he's up to in our lives. The first thing that we see are the adversities in the pit. The second thing that we see are the allurements in Potiphar's house. Joseph is sold to the caravan of Ishmaelites. They take him down to Egypt, and he's sold to Potiphar, an officer in Pharaoh's army. And the Bible says, as it says over and over again, and the Lord was with Joseph, and the Lord was with Joseph. And Potiphar saw that the Lord was with Joseph and gave him command over his entire household. And immediately the allurements and the temptations begin. The Bible says that Joseph was well built. He was handsome, and Potiphar's wife took notice of this, and she looks at him and she says, come lie with me. Come lie with me. Someone once asked, why does opportunity knock only once while temptation bangs at our door constantly? Why is that? We all know that Joseph is a dreamer, but now we meet a woman who's dreaming about the dreamer. She said to him, give in to my enticements. Given to my allurements, given to my desires, I can give you all the pleasures of Egypt. You know what she was trying to do? She was trying to get Joseph to exchange his God-given dream for hers. My dear friends, that's what the world does constantly if you're not careful. At every turn in your life story, the dream that God has implanted in your heart and all the forces around you, all the various elements around you, the navigational propensities around you, the technological world in which we live, all these things are constantly dividing your loyalties, trying to move you away from the dream that God has implanted in you. The devil tries to kill Joseph's dream in the pit. When the pain in the pit did not work, he tries all the pleasures of Egypt. That is how he still works even today in your life and mine. You know what the reality is? Mrs. Potiphar's voice is still clearly being heard in our world and in our lives even today. It is heard through the movies, through the media, through the music, 
through the TV channels that we see, through all of the technological devices that we utilize, the platforms, the technologically saturated environments in which we live, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, from your waking moment to the time you go to sleep, you're not just being informed. Please hear me this morning. You're not just being informed. It's not mere information. You're being formed. There's formation taking place. You're being structured and molded and navigated into a particular kind of person. That is what the world is constantly doing in your life. In biblical terms, you and I are being discipled. The question is not if we're being discipled, we are. The only question is who is doing the discipling? Is it Christ or culture? Is it the word of God or the media outlets out there? Through whom Potiphar's voice or Mrs. Potiphar's voice comes through loud and clear. The young people who are here, the concerts that you attend, the movies that you see, the conversations that you have, the friendships that you belong to, her voice comes through over and over again, enticing you with all the temptations of this world, trying to get you to exchange your God-given dreams for what the world has to offer. C.S. Lewis writes in one of his books that we are becoming creatures of great glory or creatures of absolute horror based on the decisions that we make each and every day. How do you make the decisions that you make? Who is speaking into your life? What influences are shaping and navigating you every single moment of your life? Let's say you're on a journey. Let's say you're taking the train. When you go from one point to your destination, people who are not going to the same destination get off at various stops, don't they? We need to do the same in life. People in your life who are not headed towards the same foreordained destination that God has for you, that God has for you, they need to get off your life. That means that certain relationships will have to go. That means that certain acquaintances will have to go. That means that certain conversations will need to end. That means that certain places that you visit, certain places that you frequent will need to come to a stop. My dear friends, it's better to have the favor of God in the place of his purpose than to pursue our passions just for the sake of pleasure. G.K. Chesterton, the great English journalist, once said, meaninglessness in life does not come from becoming weary of pain. Meaninglessness in life comes from becoming weary of pleasure. How do you navigate your desires, your affections, your emotions, your thoughts, are they centered on his word? Is a spirit speaking into your life or is it some other voice? How do you navigate your desires? A young man was walking the shores of the beaches of Chennai and he looked up to the heavens and he said, you know, God, I have a deep desire in my heart. My desire is that you build this great bridge from the beaches of Chennai all the way to Singapore. Build this bridge so I can go over to Singapore anytime I want and build a car for me that'll get me there in about five to ten minutes. Can you do that? There was a booming voice from heaven and the Lord said, son, that's a large undertaking. Think of the resources. Think of all the material. Think of the energy I would have to expend. Think of all the planning that would go into such a project. I can do it. I have the power and the authority. I can do it. But why don't you ask me something that'll help you to grow as a person? something that is more spiritually beneficial. So the young man thought about it for a moment, and then he said, all right, Lord, I thought about it, and I want to become a better person, and more importantly, I want to become a better husband. This is my new desire. I want to understand my wife, especially when she gives me the silent treatment. There was a pause, and God asked, how soon do you want the bridge and the car? My dear friends, our desires... When Joseph faced temptation in Potiphar's house, what did he do? He resisted. He resisted. Do you resist the allurements and the enticements and the temptations of this world? There was an occasion, the Bible says, when Potiphar's wife took a hold of his coat and tried to force him, force him to have this illicit relationship with her. Joseph ran away from her, did he not? 
The Bible says that Joseph ran from that place, ran away from Potiphar's wife. He asked, how can I dishonor Potiphar? How can I sin against my God? And he ran from that place. Chuck Swindoll in one of his books writes that Joseph did not stand around. He did not offer an explanation. He did not tell Potiphar's wife what his dilemma was. No, he just ran from that place, from that temptation, and from the tempter. We need to resist temptation, and we need to run from temptation. Run into the safety of the Savior's arms, and he will keep you, and he will protect you. He will make a way for you in those moments of allurements, in those moments of enticements, in those moments of temptation. The Great Wall of China, one of the seven wonders of the world. When it was originally built, it was thought to be impenetrable, but the enemy got through. Do you know how? They didn't go over it, they couldn't. They didn't go under it, they couldn't. They went right through it. You know how they did it? By bribing the gatekeepers. What bribes is the enemy of our souls offering us today? in order to get into our lives, in order to have a stronghold on our soul. Think about it, my dear friends. He's constantly bribing us, trying to derail us from the dream that God has implanted in your heart and mine. We know the rest of the story. Joseph maintained his holy and righteous living, and Potiphar's wife lies about him, and Potiphar has Joseph thrown in prison. Sometimes, when you stand for the truth, sometimes when you stand for righteousness, sometimes when you stand for holiness, it might not go well with you. But God was continually with Joseph. God was continually with Joseph. We see the allurements in Potiphar's house, and then we see the allegiance in the prison. The allegiance in the prison. Joseph is thrown into the prison through no fault of his own. How can a man who has done almost everything right in his life have everything go so wrong for him? A.W. Tozer once said, It's doubtful if God can use a man greatly unless he has hurt him deeply. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was imprisoned in the Gulag, the infamous Russian prison, wrote these marvelous words. He said, thank you, prison, for having been in my life, for it was there sitting on that rotting prison straw that I learned for the first time the significance of my existence. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German pastor, once said, I've gone through many trials and many tribulations in my life, but in the light of God's holy and righteous purpose, all these things seem trivial. All these things seem trivial. Joseph is thrown into this dark prison. His father is not there. His mother is not there. His brothers are not there. His friends are not there. But the Bible says that the Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with Joseph. And the jailer, the warden, saw that the Lord was with Joseph and gave him command over the entire prison. In the darkest of pits, in the deepest of that prison, Joseph knew that the Lord was with him. You know what he did? He started a prison ministry. You see, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker had been thrown into the same prison. And Joseph goes over to them and he asks them, how are you doing? How can I help you? How can I minister to you? In the midst of this darkness, how can I be the light? In the midst of everything that has gone wrong, how can I offer some hope? My dear friends, sometimes the greatest of ministries, please hear me this morning. Sometimes the greatest of ministries are birthed in the darkest of places. Because in those moments, God implants something in your heart and in your soul that never fades. It lights up a flame within you and it will never be vanquished. Joseph ministers to them. We all have our prison experiences, don't we? It might not be a physical prison. Whatever it, is that, whatever it is that locks you in. It may be psychological. It may be a health issue. It may be relational. Whatever it is, 
you feel so locked in without the ability to move to the left or to the right, forward or backward. In that prison experience, sometimes you might begin to wonder, where is God in all of this? Where is that dream he gave me that he implanted in my soul? I don't see the possibility of any of it coming to fruition. How can this be? I'm deep in this prison. Where is God? Well, the God who was with Joseph is with you this morning. He has not changed. He is here, right here, in our midst this morning. Right here in Saidapet. God is walking in our midst. He is with you. And he's telling you, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm not a man that I should lie. I know the end from the beginning. Your life is in the palm of my hands. And I am still in control. I am with you. He says in Isaiah 43 too, When you walk through the waters, I will be with you. When you walk through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, it will not burn you. The flames will not engulf you. It's easy to praise the Lord when everything is going well. It's easy to say hallelujah, praise the Lord when the bills are paid, when everyone is doing well, when there is health, when all the equations of life come together, converge together on time. But when you're going through trials and tribulations, when the pain that you're experiencing is breaking your heart and you still lift up your head and your hands to the he heavens and you cry out, praise be to God, then you're getting somewhere in your faith. In the midst of that darkness, in the midst of that pain, in the midst of that trial, in the midst of that tribulation, when you cry out to him, praise be to the Lord, you're getting somewhere in your faith. God reminds us, as the old song says, that the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. That the God of the good times is the God in the bad times. That the God of the day is still, is still God in the night. Joseph began a prison ministry in the darkness and in the depths of that prison. And now the cupbearer and the baker begin to have dreams. And they tell Joseph about their dreams. And Joseph interprets the dreams for them. He looks at the baker and says that he'll be killed in three days. He looks at the cupbearer and says that he'll be restored to his original position in Pharaoh's court. And then he says to the cupbearer, when you're restored, please, please remember me. Get me out of this prison. This shows us Joseph's humanity, does it not? But then the Bible says, the word of God says, that the cupbearer forgot Joseph for how many years? Two years. That shows the cupbearer's humanity. But in spite of it all, Joseph waited patiently, did he not? The Lord was with Joseph, and Joseph's life was centered on the Lord, and he waited upon him patiently. Faithful living requires waiting patiently in the presence of the Lord. Waiting times are never wasted times in the economy of the kingdom, my dear brothers and my dear sisters. God wants us to wait upon him. He wants us to wait upon him. That is why Isaiah 40 says, Do you not know, have you not heard, that the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary. Young men stumble and fall, but those who wait upon the Lord, those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. Wait upon him. Dear father, dear mother, you've been praying for years. Wait upon him. The grandparents who are here, wait upon him. Young man, young lady, with all the possibilities of the future, wait upon him. Wait upon him. He is a covenant-making, covenant-keeping God. What he has decreed in your life will come to pass. The dreams he has implanted in you, he will bring to fruition, but you need to wait upon him. And in all the situations of life, in all the circumstances of life, especially when you face the prison experiences of your life like Joseph, have your allegiance intact in him. 
never be shaken. He is the foundation for life. Just like Joseph, keep your allegiance in him. We see Joseph's allegiance in the prison. And then finally, we see his advancement in the palace. We see his advancement in the palace. Now Pharaoh begins to have dreams. And the cupbearer suddenly remembers Joseph. And he tells Pharaoh about Joseph. And Joseph is summoned to the palace. My dear friends, I want you to realize something. When the favor of God is upon your life, he can take you from the prison to the palace through a word from a prince in Pharaoh's court or a prisoner in Pharaoh's cell. Because whether you're in the pit or in the prison or in the palace, God Almighty is still on his throne. The sovereign God of the universe, the one who knows the end from the beginning, the one who's not taken by surprise is still on his throne. And he navigates your life as he will according to his purposes and his divine timing. Joseph is brought to the palace. Pharaoh looks at him and says, I've had dreams. And Joseph interprets his dreams for him. Joseph looks at Pharaoh and says, there'll be years of plenty. Then there'll be years of lack. And he gives a blueprint to secure the future of Egypt. And then something marvelous happens. Pharaoh looks at one of his advisors, and then he points to Joseph and he asks him, have you ever seen a young man on whom is the very Spirit of God? Is that how you live your life, my dear friend? That when people look at you, they marvel and they wonder, have you ever seen a young man? Have you ever seen a young woman on whom is the very Spirit of God? The greatest problem in our spiritual life, in our spiritual journey is this, when there is a contradiction between what we believe and how we live. Pharaoh says, have you ever seen a young man? This is a pagan ruler. And he asks, have you ever seen someone on whom is the very Spirit of God? I don't want you to miss this. Pharaoh looks at Joseph and he asks him, are you the one? Are you the one who's going to interpret my dreams? Are you the one who's going to settle my maladies? What does, what does Joseph say? We often kind of skip this part or overlook this part. What does Joseph say? He says, no, I'm not the one. He says, no, I cannot do it. I don't have the capacity. I don't have the ability. No, but my God can. But my God can. Always pointing to his Lord giving God the glory, keeping the focus on his Lord. You know, when he said no, Pharaoh could have thrown him right back into prison. That's the truth of the matter. How foolish of this young man. Finally, he gets the opportunity for advancement. Finally, he's in front of Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world at the time. Pharaoh can make things happen. All he needs is Pharaoh's agency and Pharaoh's goodwill. And Pharaoh is asking him, can you interpret my dreams? And this foolish young man says, no, I cannot. Anyone else in his place would have said, yes, I can. I can interpret your dreams. I can do anything that you want me to do. I can even fly if you want me to fly. I've suffered so much in my life. I was 13, 17 years old when God implanted the dream in my heart. I've suffered for 13 long years. I've been in the pit. I've been in the prison. People betrayed me, lied about me, tried to have me killed. All this suffering, all this pain, all the trials and tribulations. Finally, I'm standing before you. I'm going to interpret your dreams. I'm going to do everything that you want me to do. I want to taste the sweet waters of success that have eluded me for 13 long years. Let me interpret your dreams and let me get the applause. Let me get the accolades. Let me get the success. It's eluded me for far too long. That's what anyone would have done. That's what a normal person would have done given this tremendous opportunity. But Joseph says, no. No, I cannot. But my God can. My God who has been with me in the pit and in the prison. My God whose presence has been with me. My God who has been faithful in my life, I cannot deny him. He's the only one who gives me the power and the access to these realities. I cannot, but my God can. I cannot, but my God can. You see, Joseph was not just looking for success. He was looking to be a person of value. 
Because Joseph knew that when God takes you from where you are to where he wants you to be, he doesn't take you in a straight line. The pit and the prison had to come before the palace so that when you get to the palace, you don't lose your sense of purpose. Are you hearing me this morning? Life is not about going from success to success. God is interested in more than success. We live in the context of a culture and a world that knows the price of everything but the value of nothing. And in that context, God wants to raise a generation, a generation that is concerned about kingdom values, not just success but value. That is what God is looking for. The parents and the grandparents who are here, what sort of values are you instilling in your kids? We want them to be educated, that's true. We want them to have a good career, nothing wrong with that. But in the midst of pursuing all these things, in the midst of pursuing all these accolades, all these accomplishments, all these avenues, all these roads, are you instilling something in them of deep and eternal value? How are we raising the next generation? In his advancement to the palace, Joseph shows himself to be a person of value. And then secondly, he shows himself to be a person of virtue. And he exemplifies the virtue in two ways. First and foremost, by forgiving his brothers. I don't have time to go into the scripture right now. But six references to Joseph weeping happens after he has been appointed the second most powerful man in all of Egypt. He looks at his brothers and he says, what you did was wrong. You tried to kill me. It was evil. But I forgive you. But I forgive you. I don't want to be navigated by the pain of my past. I forgive you. How do you forgive someone who has hurt you? Who has schemed against you? Who has thrown you into the pit and into the prison? By looking at them through the eyes of a forgiving God. That's the only way. The only way by which you can forgive them. But you know what the problem is, my dear friends? God brings us to the palace, as it were. The place of our purpose, as it were. Physically, we are in the palace and in the place of purpose, as it were. But mentally, in our mind, in our consciousness, we are still in the pit and in the prison, trying to get back at the people who put us there. Is that not true? What does Joseph say? God has already turned it around. You deemed it for evil. What you did was absolutely evil. But my God has taken all of that evil and he has turned it around for my good. My dear brother, my dear sister, God has taken all of it and turned it around for your good. Don't just have a vision for the future. Have a proper memory of the past. He redeems your present and your past and presents the possibilities of the future. But in order for you to cleanse your future, you need to exercise forgiveness in your life. A little boy went to the store with his mom, and he behaved rather badly. And his mother was very angry. As they were driving back home, he looked at his mother and he asked her, Mommy, does the Bible say that God forgives us of our sins when we confess it to him? The mother said, yes, honey. Then he asked her, does the Bible say that when we confess our sin, God throws it into the deepest seas? And the mother said, yes, if the Bible says that, it should be true. The son looked at his mother and said, Mommy, I've confessed all my sins to God, and I believe he has forgiven me of all my sins, and he has thrown it into the deepest seas. But when we get home, you're going to go fishing for them, aren't you? My dear friends, sometimes we're like that, aren't we? Five years go by, ten years go by. God has already turned it around for our good. And what do we do? We go fishing for the sins of others. Because we want to have the satisfaction of throwing it back at their face. Letting them know how you were hurt and how you were violated. But God is looking into the depths of your heart and mind this morning. And he's saying to us, let it go. Let it go. Let forgiveness flow in and through your heart and overflow from your life and touch the life of another. I've already turned it around for your good. He shows his virtue by forgiving his brothers. And finally, he shows his virtue by not forgetting his father. 
the Bible says that he brought Jacob to the land of Egypt and Jacob blessed his children. What a wonderful privilege it is to have the grandparents bless the next generation. And then Jacob is buried in the land of Cana just as he had wished. My dear brothers, my dear sisters, are you a blessing in your Bible study group? That's wonderful. Are you a blessing in this church? That's great. Do you give to missions, take part in worship, volunteer as much as you can, give of your resources and your time? I applaud you. Let me ask you something. Are you a blessing in your family? In the light of all the pursuits of life, have you forgotten your father and your mother? We live in the context of a culture that does not honor its parents or its grandparents. Is that not true? I'm not asking if you agree with them. I'm asking you if you honor them. Don't kid yourself. You are not who you are because of your accolades, because of your education, because of all that you've accomplished. You and I are who we are because of God's grace and the prayers of our parents and our grandparents, period. People who have been on their knees praying to the Lord. Use my son, Lord. Use my daughter, Lord. Use my grandson. Use my granddaughter for your glory with tears. And God saw those tears, and he has blessed you, and he has blessed me. That's the absolute truth. There is no self-made man. There is no self-made woman. We cannot pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. That is the lie of the enemy. Everything that you are, in the core of your being, every fiber of your being, every dimension of your life, every area of your life, every arena of your life, all the possibilities of the future, everything is because of God's grace and the prayers of our parents and our grandparents. And so the parents and the grandparents in this assembly, we applaud you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your prayers. Don't forget your father or your mother. Look at Jesus upon the cross of Calvary. He's dying for the sins of the entire world, down through history. Millions and billions of people, and what does he do? He does not forget his mother. His responsibility is intact. Joseph showed that responsibility. Joseph exemplified it in his life. He showed his virtue by being a person of value and being a person who did not forget his father and forgave all of his brothers. What an amazing life this young man led. God implanted the dream. The dream giver gave him a dream when he was 17 years old. And then for 13 long years, he shaped and molded and navigated his life. This is not a story of going from rags to riches. The story of Joseph has nothing to do with success. It has everything to do with a sovereign God who implanted this dream in this young man and then worked on the dreamer for 13 long years. Is that not true? My dear friends, God is working in and through your life even today. Right here this morning at this service in Saidapet, God is on your trail. The hound of heaven, as it were, is working in and through your life. You may not see it, you may not feel it, but he's right there. Because the God who was with Joseph is with you, is with you. We see the adversities in the pit. We see the detractors, the detours, and the delays. We see the allurements at Potiphar's house, how Joseph resisted and how he ran from that place and from the tempter. We see the allegiance in the prison, how he started a prison ministry, and how he waited patiently. And then we see the advancement in the palace. He was not just a person of success, he was a person of value, and he was a person of virtue, and he showed his virtue by forgiving his brothers and by not forgetting his father. Let me just converge it all together and conclude. The Greeks had a race in the Olympics. The winner of that race was not necessarily the man who finished first. It was the man who finished with his torch still lit. I want to run that kind of race. I want to keep the flame burning. And when I come to the end of the race, 
it will not be because of my accolades, my achievements, my degrees, all my positions, my privileges. Not because I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. It will be because the Lord who was with Joseph has been with me all along. The Lord who was with Joseph is with you. Every dream he has implanted in your life, he will bring to pass. That is his promise. He will do it in his time for his purpose and for his glory. The dream giver is working in and through your life. You who are his dreamer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again. We thank you for the service. I thank you for each and every person here. Lord, you know us in the intimate areas of our hearts. You know every detail of our lives. You know our struggles, our hurts, our pains, our disappointments, the pits, the prisons. Lord, help us to always keep our eyes upon you like Joseph. Help us to move forward into the establishment of your dream in our lives, the manifestation of what you've implanted in our hearts by looking to you because you are faithful. The one who has called us is faithful and he is with us every step of the way. Never leave us nor forsake us. Help us, Lord, to continue to move forward with a sense of confidence and a sense of assurance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Finney, for encouraging us through your words and also not, not just encouragement, but the lesson that you gave. You asked few tough questions, actually, and also the invitation to live a life of value and virtue. And thank you so much for that. And as a church, what we can do uh, for Brother Finney is like, we, what he was explaining in the beginning, that we live in a very difficult world, right? We're in the, the, the values and everything has changed now, right? And what he and his ministry is doing in the world, we need such people more and more. All right, so we can only pray for them and we can pray to God that God raise a lot of people like Brother Feng, right? So with that, uh, we are uh, nearing the end of the service. So we don't end the service without, uh, without calling the people who say that you have come for the first time to the church. I mean, to this church, not to the church, but to this church. So anybody who says that this is your first time to NLAG, uh, if you can raise your hand. And in fact, if you can stand up, please. Anybody? Okay. One. Anybody else? Okay, so we have one brother here, and uh, we are so glad that uh, you're with us uh, today. Uh, so th this is how we welcome people, and we also, what we want to do is we want to meet you, and we have our leaders who actually want to meet you and spend some time with you. Don't worry, they'll not take uh, hours. Their love will not endure forever. Uh, so... They'll just talk to you for like 10 minutes and uh, then, then they'll let you go. So I think uh, um, Manoj is there who can help you with that. And then you can talk to our leaders there. Yeah. So uh, guys, we all will raise up now and we'll close the service with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this wonderful time that you gave our Father. When we really want to thank you for the Sundays where we gather together, we worship your name, our Father. When we come together to... to, to together to worship your name, to, to learn from your scripture, oh Father. And thank you so much for bringing Brother Finney today through his words and through his, through his experience and through, through, through the scripture, how he explained us things, oh Father. Lord, I pray that whatever he taught us today, oh Lord, that we can take it back home, oh Father, and we will learn from that, oh Father. We'll learn, oh Lord, and we'll start implementing that in, in our life, oh Lord. It is not just a nice, wonderful English sermon to hear, oh Father, but that is that would be the sermon which would change our life, our Father, that would, that would give us the direction, our Father, Lord. We pray that this will work in our life, our Father, Lord. We surrender everybody, each and everybody who is there present in this particular service, our Father. We surrender all of them into your hand, our Father. Help us that we will live a life according to your will in your presence, our Father. We surrender everything into your hand. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's pronounce the benedic benediction together. May the love of the Father, the grace of his Son, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us. And the church says, Amen. Thank you. Go in peace.